Are we talking like all rice, grains, corn? Is that all going to be created in a, a lab? Well, I guess that's probably the long-term aspiration. At the moment, the focus is more on protein. So it's basically a high-protein product, something like tofu, which is obviously based on soy, which is farmed or more to the point, replacing meat. So one, one of the arguments behind this is that meat is bad for the environment, bad for the planet. We can't produce enough meat to feed everybody globally, so we have to transition from meat. So welcome back to another episode of El Podcast. Today's guest is Chris Smage, who is a social scientist and farmer who has been working on a small farm in England for the past 20 years. He is a leading voice in the global movement for agroecology and is the author of the book, Saying No to a Farm-Free Future, The Case for an Ecological Food System and Against Manufactured Foods, which is today's topic on our podcast. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us today. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks for inviting me. So in your book, you mentioned that a movement is underway to replace foods produced on farms with the quote-unquote farm-free food, which is in the title of your book, with foods that are created in labs and factories, and they use the term precision fermentation. What exactly is precision fermentation, and then how does this compare to traditional farming methods? Yeah, there's a whole bunch of different methods, and I have to preface this by saying that I'm not a biotech person. I'm a small-scale farmer and social scientist, so this is just on the basis of what I've learned about these techniques. So there are different techniques, but the one that I focus on in my book is one that's getting a lot of airplay at the minute and the idea is that you use electricity generated electricity to split water basically into its constituents of hydrogen and oxygen you feed the hydrogen and oxygen and a bunch of other things into a steel bioreactor that contain particular sorts of bacteria hydrogen oxygenating bacteria that prompts the bacteria to grow and ultimately they produce this kind of slurry of biomass protein rich biomass that you then kind of filter and dry and process it and you get basically a protein rich powder or material that can be used as human food that's the idea the logic of it is that you can produce it on a relatively small area whereas farming takes up quite a lot of land the idea is that you can produce it on a smaller area which is potentially good for nature because the argument is that farming is bad for the wild things you know it takes up too much room causes biodiversity loss a bunch of other things as well you can sort of contain the process more easily and so on but that that, that's the basic idea in your book saying no to a farm-free future, you use the words food as software, precision fermentation, and manufactured foods. Are all of these three terms interchangeable? Well, there's a lot of kind of boosting of this whole field and different people are uh, talking about different things. So precision fermentation is a term that's applied to uh, the, the process I just described. I tend to try and avoid using it because I think it's a little bit of a kind of marketing and industry term i use the phrase manufactured food uh i mean that has its problems all of these terms have its problems food as software is the idea that um we can genetically engineer uh different foods um that the biotech people can fiddle about with the genetic sequence of different um bacteria uh, and and produce a whole bunch of different weird and wonderful foods and flavors so it's almost like you have a kind of data bank that you can produce a a whole bunch of different foods in your factory just by kind of downloading the code for the particular food that has been developed by somebody it's that sort of idea there's a lot of these different terms around which are not always interchangeable and as with everything people argue about which terms they prefer and and so on. But those are the sorts of ideas in play. People often talk about fake meat. There's a whole different process, which is taking animal cells. So, you know, you basically start with 
real animal cells and then try to build them up outside the animal in a sort of lab or industrial facility. So the kind of stuff we're talking about, so-called precision fermentation, is a different process. But obviously, there's loads and loads of these kind of biotech ideas out there. Maybe a thing to stress is that the way it's manifested so far has been in kind of high value, low bulk stuff, like the famous fake blood for a plant burger, like the sort of little food additives like that. What I'm talking about in my book is an attempt to produce food in bulk, produce high protein food or fat based food in bulk. So rather than your meat or your soy or maybe even your grain crops. We're talking about manufacturing foods to meet those major dietary requirements of people globally. Are we talking like all rice, grains, corn? Is that all going to be created in a a lab or a reactor? Well, I guess that's probably the long-term aspiration. At the moment, the focus is more on protein. So it's basically a high-protein product, something like tofu, which is obviously based on soy, which is farmed, so it's you know, the idea is replacing that or more to the point, replacing meat. So one, one of the arguments behind this is that meat is bad for the environment, bad for the planet. We can't produce enough meat to feed everybody globally. So we have to transition from meat. We could transition or just use soy and other pulses at legumes. But the argument is that we should switch to the manufactured food. It's tougher to go to the kind of things you mentioned, rice, wheat, and so on, the, you know, the, the get, getting the carbo crops, but maybe that's the longer term aspiration. I, I don't know. So for the audience, give us your one minute overall thesis of what the book saying no to a farm free feature is. Right. Well, we're in this huge crisis. A lot of people talk, call it the poly crisis or the meta crisis. Climate change is massive thing that we have to deal with. We have to move out of fossil fuels, so that implies changing the energy economy towards low-carbon, renewable energy. Biodiversity crisis, I mentioned this idea of farming being bad for nature, so one of the arguments is we need to reduce the human footprint on the land, and that's part of the impetus behind this, and a whole bunch of economic, political crises. The argument for manufactured food is that it's a way of tackling these various issues. The problem, as I see it, if you're going to argue that it's going to deal with some of our environmental issues, it's going to have to be a low carbon process and it's basically very high energy using. We're trying to decarbonize the energy economy. That means stopping using fossil fuels, figuring out how are we going to make steel, how are we going to continue to live in our great big urban conglomerations, how are we going to make transport work, all the other materials that we use in modern life. If you add on top of that, trying to produce food using generated electricity, so bear in mind this is moving away from using sunlight to grow food. Sunlight is basically this zero carbon resource that just lands on our ground regardless So the idea is to move away from that, use generated electricity to produce food on a smaller land footprint, but it's tremendously costly in terms of generated electricity. And we're not doing a great job in terms of decarbonizing the energy system. So my argument is this doesn't really stack up on energetic and low carbon electricity grounds. There's a bunch of other reasons, I think, why It's also not a great idea, but that's probably the sort of main technical stumbling block. You mentioned in the book, you got billionaires like Bill Gates and James Dyson buying up a bunch of farmland. And in the case of Bill Gates, he's building nuclear power plants as well, or funding nuclear power plants. And then you also mention tech bros and how Bill Gates made his money. I mean, Bill Gates made his money by being a monopolist patent right holder. And he's not only done that with Microsoft, he did that with the jab during the pandemic as he was one of the biggest stockholders of some of those pharmaceutical companies. So to me, it seems like he's just trying to take over the food supply, make manufactured food so he can patent it and make a bunch of money. Well, there's a real fear that corporate monopoly is um, is going to be a problem with this and There's already corporate monopoly within the food system. A lot of the big global commodity trade is in the hands of a small number of corporations. But my argument, you began by 
saying that I was an advocate for agroecology and, and small scale local agriculture. That's basically where I'm coming from in terms of how we can best face the future. And the reality is that for sure, people can monopolize access to land, they can monopolize food trade. Nevertheless, it's still possible for people to carve out some autonomy to get some land to produce crops locally. That's the way that we need to go if we sort of go down this manufactured food route and sort of with all that it implies in terms of the ability to move to corporate monopoly, the kind of pressure to move people out of the countryside to supposedly to reduce the impact on nature. I think that can lead to some pretty dystopian outcomes. And as you say, it puts an awful lot of power into the people who are able to control the process. And in my view, yeah, it is going to be easier to control this kind of process, to monopolize this process than it is with the kind of more familiar farmed foods that we already have. I'm not trying to be too romantic about the existing food system, which for sure has all sorts of issues around corporate monopoly. But I think with this kind of approach, if it was viable, we'd be in a worse situation. Speaking about the corporate control, you mentioned in your book, you write, a criticism widely leveled that manufactured food is the danger of corporate control. And a quote, Google, Android, and the iPhone have a 95% market penetration globally, whereas the top 10 agricultural corporations, they control 45% of the global agricultural sector. And the global agricultural market is valued at about $6 trillion, which means that there is over $3 trillion that's not in the hands of corporations. And the energy sector is uh, what a $400 trillion market globally. It seems to me that Bill Gates and these people just, it's all about money, in my opinion. I saw Chamath on a podcast say he thinks we'll see the first trillionaire in in our lifetime, and he thinks that trillionaire will be in the energy sector. Yeah, energy is very easy to monopolize if you take any form of power generation or obviously the whole fossil fuel sector. It's inherently pretty monopolistic. I don't know about those exact figures that you quoted, but yeah, that's for sure the food system. There's so much that goes on, so much food production and consumption that goes on outside of those, even outside the monetary system, there's various studies worldwide and sort of debates about the exact figure. But there's an awful lot of small farms globally and gardens, you know, people are producing food for themselves and eating it themselves or engaged in informal networks locally. And that's sort of my argument is that's what we need to accentuate, particularly in terms of the ecological impact of our food because there's a huge push to overproduction to monetize food production and that in itself is one of the big ecological bads that farming pushes out into previously wild unfarmed habitats as a result of this kind of pressure to monetize and to increase or maintain profits so the more that we can take responsibility for food production within our own communities and households and get the feedback, the ecological feedback involved in producing our own food. How does that work? What kind of pests and diseases? What kind of impact is it having on the local ecology? The more that we can place ourselves in that process as citizens, I think that the better position will be. Your book, you mentioned Peter Zion. And you said you disagree with him on a lot of things, but I think you agree with his overall point that the current global trading system is unlikely to last in the 21st century. And we're going to see kind of depopulation, people running out of the cities, getting into the rural side as food systems and just the entire global supply chain breaks down. I think we're kind of seeing that. And he talks about how basically after World War II, the United States set up Brenton Woods as a way to intertwine the economies of the world as a way to ensure peace. And now that system's breaking apart is kind of Peter Zeehan's overall thesis. You have Bill Gates and Dyson, as you mentioned, who want to bring people into these cities. I mean, we have the whole World Economic Forum saying we're going to have 15-minute cities. And then you have Peter Zeehan, on the other hand, saying we're going to go the complete opposite direction. So it seems like we have competing forces. I mean, you in your book, basically think we're going to go back to the countryside as well. Who is right here? How do you see this playing out in the next decade? 
Yeah, it is complicated, but I do largely agree with Zihan's overall analysis of the, the, the geopolitics. Like you say, we've had this period of global history emerging out of the early 20th century and, and world war and a kind of trading system very much backed by US power kind of in a Cold War context that's now kind of passing into history, but obviously new conflicts firing up. Russia, Ukraine, China, and so on. But the the degree of urbanization that we've had globally, more people now living in urban areas than in rural ones, that has very much been driven by the availability of cheap, abundant fossil fuels that kind of breaks the local connection between where we live and the kind of food and water and local energy economy. So an awful lot depends on the view you take about how that's going to play out. But yeah, I think basically without cheap fossil fuels, it's very hard to sustain those kind of mega cities. And that then is going to become an arena of conflict in terms of global powers and regional powers using their leverage around food, water, energy. So for sure, part of my argument is if you take some sort of global mega cities, particularly in the global south, there's a lot of underemployment, unemployment, people trying to scratch a living one way or another, largely in service sector industries that are not a secure route to prosperity. If you try and add to that with this notion that we need to urbanize further or deruralize, use manufactured food and, you know, Different people in this debate take different views about how that's going to play out in terms of urbanization. But my view is if you push the logic of the manufactured food idea and the idea of reducing our land footprint, that ultimately is what you're arguing for. You're arguing for urbanization. And that doesn't seem to me a great bet in the present situation. The fact that cities are already struggling in terms of that their kind of uh, economic base, but also adding that geopolitical level in terms of global conflict over resources, over water, over energy, over food. It seems to me a much better bet is to spread ourselves out and start making ourselves kind of local ecological protagonists. And, and of course, that historically is what people did. I mean, going back to this whole issue of how we energize the food system, you know, historically, the f food has been energized by sunlight, which is a huge amount of energy c coming in, but it's diffuse. And so people are also diffuse. And I think that's ultimately that's the kind of hard biophysical logic that we're going to have to embrace. And the quicker and better we embrace it now, the, the less of a shock it's going to be in the long term. I think during the pandemic, it seemed like it split the world into half. You have the people that think that the government and these jabs and these elite institutions were doing good things. And then you have the other half that kind of thinks that these people are trying to use this for control and they're sinister. And I mean, the reason I, I like your book, I agree with your overall thesis. I do think we need to have control of our food supply. I mean, I grew up on a farm in Wisconsin. And then the guy watched a lot of political hearings in Washington. And you have people that basically try to tell citizens how to live and they have really no clue how anything works the stupidest people in our society are in politics when you have the mayor of new york city as well as the mayor of london basically trying to ban meat and dairy and tell people how to live and then they're telling us we're going to be eating fake meat people are going to push back on this stuff because i think they overplayed their hand they over controlled people during the pandemic and now no one has any trust i shouldn't say no one but a lot of people don't have any trust in any academia or any government institution like trust is broken down this is the first time in my life i'm 41 this is the first time in my life where i really feel like the future is very precarious and can go in any direction well that's for sure yeah we're in this kind of weird historical moment and i agree with you i mean i might take a different line to you on aspects of the pandemic but I, I agree with you that it showed a real mistrust and a real kind of breakdown in the political compact if you like between citizens and government and that's led to some interesting realignments in politics i think to some extent it's quite critical in terms of some of the traditional political alignments breaking down where you know one argument is 
trust the centre, trust governments to figure out all these tremendously complicated issues around food, energy, water, you know, trust that kind of corporate and public connection to sort this out. I don't personally <laughs> trust them or I mean, it's partly trust, it's partly you just can't figure out the complexity of this sort of stuff from the centre. I sort of come from a more of a maybe a traditional kind of leftist position, but that does put me in company with a more libertarian, bottom-up, grassroots and questioning position around the way that centralised political power works. So, yeah, I would agree with you on that. And we might disagree about what that kind of local politics looks like and how we're going to figure all this stuff out. But I do believe in the importance of grassroots, bottom-up, citizen and community um, or organizing not to try and deal with problems top down as a sort of global problem that has to be dealt with through some kind of single high tech means but to actually embrace the way that these issues manifest locally and, and try and figure them out at that level so yeah how how far off are we from having our entire food system changed we already see that the usda approved the sale of or the manufacture of artificial meat. Whole Foods I've seen has milk that's produced via precision fermentation. How far off are we? Is this stuff currently going on? When GMOs were first out, they never even had to label. You know, that when GMOs came out in 1992, I actually had Dr. Marion Nessel on last week, and she was in on those meetings and said they didn't even have to put GMO on the label when they came out. Yeah, in terms of the precision, so-called precision fermentation technology that we're talking about, I think we're a long way off from it being mainstream. I don't know about precision fermentation in milk that you mentioned. As I said, I think most of it at the moment has very much been more about food additives rather than this bulk food kind of stuff. It, you know, it's all part of a larger corporate capture of the food system. And in some ways, we can take different positions around part of this debate has been about meat and livestock but as i see it that the, there's a kind of corporate anti-livestock narrative around precision fermentation there's a corporate pro-livestock uh, narrative the key thing is about monopolization in the system here in the uk we've just gone through brexit which has been a huge debate about our sort of relative autonomy from a larger governmental system one potentially positive aspect of that was that it gave us more national and potentially local autonomy over the food system. But the government, they signed a big trade deal with Australia, which means we're starting to import food grown under a different system, different standards into the UK, which sort of undermines UK farmers. So my view is that we need to stop these big flows of commodity foods, which is another aspect of this. So much of global farmland is geared to producing just a small number of commodity crops, you know, wheat, rice, maize, soy are the four big ones, which are easily processable. They can be easily um, transported and, and processed into lots of different things. So we need to sort of reclaim some of that, that sort of corporate commodity system agricultural space for a greater diversity of local foods that we can produce in our own communities for ourselves so yeah i think there is a battle brewing between the sort of idea of the government is going to take care of this and figure out all these issues around climate energy biodiversity loss that's not something that we should try and take care of locally versus that kind of agrarian localist approach that I've been talking about. You mentioned the book Bullshit Jobs, which I do like that book. I've read that book a couple of times. I agree with most of what he had to say in that book. Anyways, I think the pandemic really showed how many people actually have bullshit jobs. And the people will go back to the countryside. We're already seeing people leaving the cities since the pandemic started in the United States. And this is basically the first time this has happened since the founding of the country. But then you mentioned in the book how people use age, life expectancy as a barometer of a successful civilization. And then you, you kind of question like, oh, you know, what is that barometer? And I think most people don't really have a whole lot of meaning in their lives. Like I grew up in the country, the ability to raise your own farm animals, the ability to be self-sufficient, like you have that connection. You're a social scientist. It seems like food 
and culture are maybe two of the most intertwined things in our society. And when you want to create fake meat or you want to create artificial foods, you're really disconnecting the connection that goes back to really the heart of culture, of any culture for that matter. Yeah, yeah. No, I think you're touching on some important points there. The one point is the tendency to be scornful or dismissive of rural people and agrarian people and to discount local knowledges, like knowledges about local foods. And we are very alienated from that. The big story over the last century, that whole kind of urbanization and trading thing we were talking about has pushed a lot of people out of that. But there are still um, billions of small farmers globally, mostly not in countries like the UK or the US, but nevertheless, there's still a lot of rural and agrarian people. There's just historically been this dismissiveness about their skills and knowledges. And like you say, the importance, I think, of rebuilding that and rebuilding strong local cultures connected to food is absolutely vital. And I think this is a problem in the kind of eco-modernist, the kind of manufactured food thesis about urbanization. You know, even if it's feasible, moving people into cities and, and, and producing food through these very high tech means, the idea behind that is that we will then sort of put less pressure on the natural world. But I think that won't work for a whole bunch of reasons, like wealthy urban populations actually have a huge footprint that reaches out around the world. But also to the extent that we're alienated from local food cultures, knowledge of rural places, knowledge of kind of being a protagonist within ecosystems, I think that will backfire massively. So, yeah, I think we need to get over this scornfulness about agrarian life and about rural life. We need to not assume that the, the problems caused by a, a, a sort of urban tech civilization are going to be solved by even more urbanism and even more high tech that then courts the criticism that you're you know you're kind of creating this romantic image of of the past and that you want to move back to some kind of old-fashioned way of life and you know it's not really about that it's not about going back anywhere it's just about figuring out how to produce food how to generate local community and culture in the here and now but, you know, I think we, we've, we have a little bit too much of a focus on this idea of progress that we've sort of moved beyond the ways that people lived in the past. Every society everywhere throughout history is trying to figure out problems in a particular historical, political and ecological setting and, and trying to figure out problems. And there's no reason why we can't learn from the way people did things in the past. It doesn't mean we're trying to replicate exactly some image of past perfection. It just means learning from the ways people have done things. And most parts of the world figured out very sophisticated, low energy nutrient cycling agricultures, usually using some livestock, some cereal and legume crops, and then a whole bunch of other trees and plants. I'm not saying that we need to replicate those exactly everywhere now, but we can learn from looking at the ways that people figured out low energy, low impact local systems in the past and start trying to uh, apply those. So yeah, we need to sort of get over ourselves a little bit, get over this urban modernism and really start thinking about food and culture and localism in, in a different way that's fit for present times. Progress is an interesting term because progress to one person could be regression to someone else. We make society more efficient. So what, you can go home and stay in your bed alone and scroll on your phone is like get everything more efficient you can spend seven hours on your phone now instead of instead of four that's all society does now is like that's progress is more time on your phone to me that seems like we're going backwards maybe you should spend some time in the garden actually or maybe you should spend time in the orchard or to me that doesn't seem like that's actually progress the question of efficiency that you raised is an important one and it's relevant to this debate because efficiency is potentially good if you choose to do something choose to do thing x then the way that you do that that involves the least effort can be good provided that you keep an eye on your end goals if you do something that takes more time um or, or whatever doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad thing so I agree with you there. The issue around the so-called precision fermentation method of food production is that it is potentially 
more efficient um, in terms of um, the way it uses energy, but it's more costly because it is not using free sunlight. It's actually uh, costing us a lot in terms of industrial infrastructure. So is that the best way to, to go about things? That's arguable. But yeah, I think we need to focus more on, on, on goals and not just talk about efficiency and progress because it's kind of efficiency to do what? Progress towards where? Uh, and, you know, that's where it, it can get complicated politically because we don't all agree on um, what the end goals are. We need to really figure this out culturally in a way that we haven't really done, certainly in countries like the UK or the US in recent years, we've had this notion that we can sort of agree to disagree and invent political systems or sort of invent cities where if you and I can't get along well, we can always move somewhere else and kind of avoid each other. But, you know, I think we're moving into a, a, a kind of lower energy world where you actually have to um, be part of a community, you have to deal with with all of the people in that community, you have to sort out differences. You have to sort out access to land. And we need to confront that rather than trying to slide around it with ways of sort of technologizing our way out of politics, basically. In an ideal world, what would some of these solutions be? And you talked about mixed farming in the book or organic farming, regenerative farming. What is the solution? I don't think the solution is... Pharma food, right? I mean, I think this it's basically pharma food that they're trying to create. Like you're saying, if you farm properly, the footprint is nowhere near as big as what people think it is. Well, yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of wastage in the larger food system. Like I was saying earlier, the sort of commodity food system tends to emphasize crops that can be sort of purified and processed in various ways. So yeah, like the key thing is basically whole foods, probably not as much meat as we are accustomed to eating in wealthy countries, because a lot of that is based on this large scale overproduction of commodity crops, but certainly livestock as part of the, the local food economy. But yeah, more fruit and vegetables, some animal products and a greater diversity of diet and less of a sort of expansionism in order to pursue those goals of greater efficiency and greater commodification of the food system that kind of pushes us into farming in places where we probably shouldn't be farming. There isn't a single solution. I try and avoid this sort of notion that there is one solution to all of these problems, but basically... A low energy food system, if you don't have a lot of cheap energy, you have to get creative about how you produce food. And that kind of pushes you towards smaller scale, more localism, more gardening. You know, gardeners are really great at figuring out how to produce a lot of healthy food in small spaces, that kind of thing. But yeah, doing it, we can talk about organic systems or sort of regenerative systems as a whole debate that I think possibly gets a little bit too much airtime about where ruminant livestock fit into the picture, but certainly thinking about creating diverse farmed and also wild habitats that, that create space for the wild creatures too. We need to be operating at, at that level, not at the level of global food commodity systems. So what's the main argument for having a future where we have less energy now than than more energy? Well, I mean... I think it's the reality, if it was possible to transition out of fossil fuels, or, or let me put that another way around, we have to transition out of fossil fuels because of climate change. We're not really doing a great job of that at the moment. There are sort of renewables and other low carbon options, but we're not really transitioning out. So I think the reality is that we either run into some real big problems with climate change, or we have to make do with less energy. Making do with less energy is not great in many ways, but it does force us towards more localism. It forces us into that kind of local citizen space that I've been talking about, creating those local cultures around food, around access to land and so on. If some sort of magic new technology appears that gives us access to low carbon, abundant energy, then that's going to push us in a different direction and it will potentially create enormous pressure on wildlife. But that's not really where I see it going. I'm not seeing this technology emerging in the time frame that is meaningful in terms of climate change. 
I think there's a lot of positives about agrarian localism, about communities developing their own solutions from the grassroots in the first place. But I think it's going to be forced upon us whether we like it or not. There's a sort of two sides to it, the reality and the ideal. And I think both of them will push us in that direction. In the United States, I think 60%-ish or so of the population doesn't believe in, in climate change. And so just for the sake of this argument, we'll say climate change isn't real. Would that change how you would view energy inputs? Would that cha- like, How would that change your argument? Does that then mean that we don't have energy constraints? Or how would that factor into the, the argument? Well, it would factor into the two sides of the argument in quite complicated ways. I I guess it wouldn't change my argument on a political and economic front and in terms of monopoly sorts of stuff we were talking about earlier. I still think that it would push towards agrarian localism on those sides. But if fossil energy wasn't causing climate change, then we can carry on extracting fossil energy and that kind of agrarian localist world isn't really on the table. We're talking about more urbanism, more monopoly commodity food systems. Of course, by the same token, it wouldn't really then justify the turn to manufactured food, except you could argue that there's still pressure on wildlife, regardless of climate change. There's still pressure on wildlife because of farming footprint interfering with wild ecosystems. So potentially it would push more towards that sort of manufactured food approach. To me, it's all hypothetical because it's very clear that fossil fuels are causing climate change and that is the reality that we're going to have to deal with. But yeah, it would change the argument for sure. I know there's a lot of people who don't buy into the fossil fuel climate change argument, but they still favour small scale localism, community, sort of grassroots, community based living and that's where I'm coming from anyway so in that sense there's there's a kind of um, connection there. I have about 100,000 TikTok followers and 40,000 Instagram followers so I get a crap ton of comments and most of my audience is conservative and the over, overwhelming comments when it comes to climate change is that people are using it a, as control and then when you see people like Bill Gates flying on their private jet to these conferences and then you have Al Gore making hundreds of millions of dollars on carbon credits. Just because you're making money doesn't mean that you're a shill, but I think people really question that or saying that the sea level rise is going to wipe out the ocean and then Obama buying a $60 million beach house and Nantucket, Maui, and Malibu. I think it it loses a lot of people. Yeah. I guess if your listeners are coming from there, I hope that they might listen to somebody like me who has a different message, which is that, yeah, climate change is real and it's going to cause a lot of problems. What I'm absolutely not arguing is, therefore, we need central governments to cede power to them to kind of manage all this top down. What I'm arguing is that puts the onus on us as citizens and communities to figure out Um, local culture, local food cultures, how we um, relate to each other as as communities. I think that's going to happen anyway, because the centre is not going to be able to hold the political uh, structure together. So people are going to be sort of innovating around this and sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. But my argument is not that climate change justifies greater central government control, but actually that climate change is going to push a lot of us to have to figure out these things for ourselves locally. How do you see the next 10, 15 years playing out? We talked about Peter Zeehan and moving away from the cities with the pandemic. You have Bill Gates saying we're going to have another one. We had the roaring 20s, which led to the, the depression. And the wealth inequality now is worse than it was during that era. This makes the robber baron era right now look like uh, I mean, a, a joke to think that the the Forbes richest people list, I think, came out in 1982 or 1983. And when that first came out, there was only 13 billionaires on it, and they were barely billionaires. The richest person in the world, I think, was Warren Buffett at the time with like $2 billion. And then the pandemic minted, what, a thousand billionaires. The wealth inequality is huge. You talked a little bit about populism in the book, and you had Brexit in England where you live, and we had Donald Trump being elected. And I think a lot of that is because of 
the wealth gap. People are not doing well. Like you say, inequality is a big issue. Cost of living, basically being able to fund the kind of lifestyles that, that are kind of presented as the desirable way to live is going to get harder. A lot of countries are going to, again, with the sort of Zihan focus, we've had this kind of uneasy global peace around global trade, which we're already seeing is breaking down around the sort of big centers of power, the U.S., Western Europe, Russia, China, India, and so on. So I think we're going to see a lot more hardball politics um, uh, uh, around all that. I think we're going to see weird climate effects, energy prices. That'll be complicated in the detail, but generally I think energy and water are going to become bigger issues. So yeah, it's going to be tough and I'm not expecting centralized governments to really be helping ordinary people very much in figuring out these problems, which brings us back to that need to figure out our local food and energy and water systems and and make ourselves parts of our local cultural and ecological landscapes as best we can. I'm not sure about the obesity rate in England, but I imagine it's similar to the U.S. where the U.S. has over a third of adults are overweight or obese. Children, it's the same thing. And every year it gets worse. And like you were talking before, how we have this overproduction of food you could lessen the impact by just not overproducing this stuff. You talked about subsidies in the U.S. There's these subsidies. So you have a lot of people growing uh, corn, which leads to monoculture because they're getting subsidized. And what do they do with that corn? They're turning it into high fructose corn syrup, putting it into your sodas, which makes people overweight. So it creates unhealthy people. It seems like we could clean up a lot of our current existing system by just getting rid of some subsidies and not having people overindulge. I got a master's in health and human performance and people, it's like, oh, how do I lose weight? It's like, eat less. And they're like, oh, no, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like, oh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Like, yeah. I guess it's more complicated. Am I bad? You know? Well, there's overproduction in the farming system. And like you say, particularly of certain commodity crops of which corn is one of the big ones. And so then it's like, but what do we do with all this corn? Well, you know, we can make uh, high fructose corn syrup. We can make all this processed food, which is full of anti-nutritional properties that are bad for people. We can feed it to livestock. We can make biofuels with it. And, you know, instead we need to be saying, well, let's not have all of this corn, or at least let's not have so much of this corn. Let's figure out healthier whole foods. But it's harder to fit those healthy local whole foods into the bigger corporate trading system, which is why it doesn't happen. And yeah, it is making us unhealthy. Obesity is a big problem in the wealthier countries, and it's to do with kind of cheap food prices and you know subsidies, both direct and indirect, that basically support the production of these kinds of commodity crops, producing processed foods that basically aren't good for us. We need to step off that treadmill really i don't know how to pronounce his name you the guy who wrote the book regenesis george yeah. Mc- mm-hmm. Mombio. Yeah. yeah your book was the criticism of his book what was the inspiration for writing this book he mentioned in there that it was going to start out as an essay and then it took off i never actually heard of the guy and i've never even heard of precision fermentation your whole book i, th- I thought was quite fascinating I think he's much better known here in the UK than than he is in the US, but he is a journalist. He's coming from the left wing and environmental perspective. And it's interesting in terms of the the, the political dimension to the discussion that, that we've had, where there is a sort of critique of large scale corporate forms of economic organization which can come from the left, but is also coming from conservatives. And in some ways, there's a more interesting localist critique of that big scale corporate economic structures coming from conservatives now that is coming from the left, which is interesting. So having had that background, he's very much now articulating what seems to me um, that more corporate monopoly approach. And he's trying to argue against ways of preventing the manufactured food industry from corporate capture but they're not terribly convincing to me i mean any type of manufacturing system you know you've been talking about things like computers or cars or anything that's manufactured in a global trading system tends to fall into a small number of global corporate players so i felt the need to 
critique that you know a whole bunch of different reasons i I don't think his vision for the future is attractive but it's partly that he is drawing progressives into quite a problematic political place without really clarifying the underlying issues so that's where i was coming from in writing it where can people find the book get a hold of you the book it's already been published here in the uk but it's being published in the us on the 20th of july so you can get it through all the normal routes it's available in a paperback and ebook and an audio version narrated by me you can get hold of it there or you can go to my website chrismage.com and i run a blog and talk about the issues in more depth And then what is your final thought that you want to leave the listening as well as the viewing audience with? We need to figure things out locally. We need to stop thinking in terms of big global problems that can only have a big global solution. We need to manifest these issues locally. That involves working with each other locally, which is not always going to be easy. So figuring out how we can relate to each other as communities and citizens is really important but the idea that a government corporate pipeline of kind of top-down solutionism that can manifest in terms of a more left-wing approach or a more sort of corporate capitalist approach and and neither of those i think ultimately have the answer we need to be working bottom-up grassroots locally obviously being in communication with other people this isn't about pulling the hatch down and only existing within our own communities but we've got to develop these kind of food cultures that we were talking about earlier locally as local citizens and make ourselves part of our environment ecological protagonists part of our communities and 20 years from now do you think that the average person will be eating fake meat and will be eating synthetic foods, these pharma foods, or do you do you think that we will actually be more rural and we'll we'll have these smaller supply chains and and we'll be eating more locally grown fruits and vegetables and I, I don't think that we'll be eating very much um manufactured food unless uh, it's something that governments and, and corporations really get behind, but I don't really see the energy side of it playing out probably what we'll see you know you were talking about inequality and poverty i think we will see governments trying to address that through essentially cheap food for the poor continuing that kind of cheap commodity pipeline which is not great for people i hope that we'll see more um fresh local whole foods more small farms more gardens people figuring this out that i think is the ultimate way for us to be healthy as people and healthy as communities the challenge is uh, the extent to which we can figure out the politics of that locally and wrest some of the political control we need from the center to to make that happen that i think is going to be a big battle to come well thank you so much chris smage for joining us the social scientist and author of the book saying no to a farm free future the case for an ecological food system and against the manufactured foods. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us and discussing your book. Links are in the description below for anyone that would like to find him. Thank you so much, Chris, for joining us. I really enjoyed this conversation today. All right. Thanks, Jesse. And once again, if you guys aren't subscribed yet, please consider subscribing. And find us on Rumble, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts as well. We thank you all dearly for watching and listening. I will see you on the next episode.